So as predicted, questions have multiplied. <laughs> <laughs> so, or maybe they're just folded in many places. So here we go. Sometimes Ashen Brown gets essays, at least I'm not getting essays yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Could you share something about the potential of metta for balancing and neutralizing extreme, uh, experiences of infatuation or clinging to someone, not lust or passion? When the mind is fixated on someone as a crush, can metta help hold them in a balanced and non-attached way, given there is enough stability? Mm. So if you're fixated on someone and uh, you already have experiences of infatuation and clinging, I would recommend not choosing them as a metta object, <laughs> simply because it actually becomes more like a difficult person. It's... Uh, there's just too much involvement there and um, in fact sometimes what's recommended in the Buddhist text is that for people that you are a little infatuated with or a lot infatuated with um, we actually do something called a subha meditation which is looking at the unattractive aspect of that person um, but that's particularly when there's lost and in this case you're asking you're saying it's not lost or passion um, I think in this case, it's probably better to start with someone that you're not so involved with. Um, and then if at some point that relationship just comes up in your mind when you've got a really pure and clear heart and you're feeling resourced, then it may help. But um, I think personally, if that were me, and I was finding I was really fixated, um... I would probably practice loving kindness towards other beings and also some compassion towards myself because often fixations are projections of our own unmet needs. Um, nothing wrong with it, but uh, thank you. <laughs> um, but it might be helpful to uh, look inside and, and uh, reflect a little bit on, on what it is in you that's uh, fixating. And even seeing the suffering in that can be helpful, seeing the clinging and attachment and noticing maybe when it's not there and how that feels. So I wouldn't um, fixate further on them by bringing them up in the loving kindness just now. Yeah. But loving kindness will generally remove those kind of clinging tendencies to the mind over time. Because the happiness starts coming from inside. Um, the happiness of metta is not a happiness that's invested in someone or something. It's more a happiness that comes when we let go of that. So I hope that makes sense. You can always ask again, if not. <clears throat> Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> How can I best combine or bring kindness meditation with breath meditation? I miss the joy and peace of breath meditation if I switch over completely at this stage. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, this is something I would talk about towards the end, but since you've asked it now, um, then that's fine. If you really want to do the breath meditation as your main vehicle, that's also okay. I would say just bring the kindness to the breath itself. You can actually almost anthropomorphize the breath and see it as a being that's, you know, born of your chest or your abdomen and that's giving you life. And you can really give it loving kindness as an attitude, if you like. Um, so this is one way to combine, to just bring more love and more care towards the breath. Um, another way, which I love to do, is to start my meditation with metta. So metta for 
whoever comes to mind at that time. It can be yourself, it can be a loved person. Loved people are very easy if you want to um, cultivate loving kindness um, for a shorter time. It might be nice to, to work with the benefactor or the loved person. And then when you feel that the mind is already quite peaceful and blissful and you're inclining more to the quiet, then you can just gradually let those words go and let the breath come to mind. But the way that I practice breath meditation is not by going out and finding the breath or bringing it up intentionally. It's more something that happens when the mind inclines to peace. So once you've had your fill of metta, and especially maybe the words, if that's uh, distracting you and you're missing the, the joy and the peace, you can drop the words and just cruise with the love, keep that attitude in mind and just see if the breath wants to come to mind. And if it does, then maybe it's a nice place for you to rest the mind and you can just carry on like that. And um, it's true that a lot of joy comes from breath meditation too. It's a slightly subtler joy sometimes. But it's really hard to put words to this. Sometimes it can be also very intense and very blissful. And it can feel almost purer initially. Like, maybe because metta goes through very high stages of PT, like a lot of happiness. And breath meditation can be um, also a lot of happiness, but it settles perhaps more quickly as well. So it can lead into tranquility, but even the metta will do as well after time. So yeah, just kind of know that you can put your foot on the pedal <laughs> at times to kind of get the, the, the joy going and also take it off at other times. And um, as you continue to practice with these methods and allow yourself to experience joy, the mind does start to incline towards uh, um, tranquility. So from PT, which is like rapture that can be felt kind of like a rush or a wave or kind of tingling sensations, it starts to settle into what we call sukha, which is more a contented kind of pleasure. And after a while, that becomes pasadi, which is tranquility. Um, and the mind gets a taste for that. So even equanimity is supposed to be much a higher happiness. Even the metta. So these Brahma Viharas are actually sequential in a way that they become more and more refined. So please practice breath meditation as much as you wish, but do um, continue to add the metta either as an attitude or also, also I would say, some cultivation as well. And you can do that as much or as little as you wish at the beginning of the meditation, at other times during the day when you're not aware of the breath, it can be easy to bring up thoughts of loving kindness, even when you're doing activities or maybe walking meditation, you can also bring up uh, thoughts of loving kindness. And uh, also before you go to sleep and when you wake up, loving kindness is a wonderful meditation to fall to sleep with. So I hope that helps. And just experiment, you know, there's no right or wrong way. I mean, the Buddha didn't go into that much detail in the suttas about particular methods um, he gave general principles and he talked about um, the natural sequence of how these things develop. Sometimes people think that's stages you've got to attain, but really he's just discussing what happens naturally um, once you put the causes in place. So you can really play and be creative and you can tailor the practice to you, to your particular inclination of mind, recognising that will change as well from time to time. What works this time might be different next time. So. Also, one more thing. When you miss the joy and peace of breath meditation, it's interesting, you know, we think that it's joy and peace, but somehow it probably is, but there's still a little attachment, isn't it? <laughs> there's still a little attachment there. So that's, that's something you can investigate as well. Hmm. Hey, there's not that many questions, so... Maybe Bamboozle has a question? Whoops. Is that your question? No. Okay. Bamboozle's always in noble silence. <laughs> it's amazing. Ten years, mind you, is living with nuns now. <laughs> All right. When meditating, especially on retreat, I see blobs or lights, sometimes flickering lights. Are these nimitas? Spelling? Yes, that's how you spell it. Does it even matter? 
Not really. Any <laughs> suggestions? <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> Any suggestions for going deeper? No. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it, that when we're going deeper, we just want to go deeper. It, it's really amazing. <laughs> this, is, this is often what comes up when we start seeing something like lights, then the immediate thought is, right, I want to go deeper, instead of, oh, this is good enough for me. <laughs> okay, but I will answer seriously. Thank you for your wonderful teaching, support, and being a great example. Sadhu! <laughs> or maybe sadhu. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so these, these lights or blobs or flickers can happen when the mind starts to become free from hindrances. Um, they don't happen to everybody. Um, sometimes people experience what we call nimittas, which literally just means a sign of the mind. Um, it can even be, in the text, it often just refers to an object. Any object can be called a nimitta. Um, but when we're talking about meditation, they usually refer to lights. They can also refer to feelings that are somehow a little bit otherworldly in the sense that they're not really experienced through the physical sense of touch, but they're starting to be experienced through the mind. So really it's just um, the physical experience of maybe peace or um, happiness starting to become a mental object, and the mind sees those sometimes as lights. Um, if they're flickering, then it's because the mind is not yet very steady, it's not very stable. Um, it's a little bit like when the PT is, is a little bit um, flickering, it's not a peaceful kind of rapture, it's kind of quite intense, then sometimes that can manifest also as light and the light will be kind of flickering. Um, so at this stage it's not um, anything to switch your attention to, it's just something to be aware of in the landscape of your mind and um, just take it as a sign that the mind is becoming empowered and energized. And carry on the metta, carry on the same way. You might feel at this kind of time that because the mind is getting uh, stronger and brighter, you don't need to keep making so much effort. I mean, hopefully you're not making too much effort anyway, but you can perhaps relax and notice silence and just let the mind settle a little bit more. Um, but it's really important at this point not to think, not to kind of give in to excitement or to try and like grasp after these things and think, oh, this is a sign that something's going to happen next because then you're out of the moment. And these things come because you've been in the moment and because you've been practicing properly. So um, when you say, does it even matter in that sense? No, it's the result of what you've already done. Um, but in another sense, uh, we do need to know how to work with them. And unless they actually become very, very stable and very strong, um, then I would say just relax, carry on your main practice, maybe with slightly less effort, and just allow them to be there. And if they wish to, and when the time's right, they may brighten up more, and they may become your predominant object. So... Always in meditation, the most important thing is not the object in front of you, but how you relate to it. So see if you can that there's no clinging there. And if you notice excitement or fear arising, then just let it be. Just accept that. Be kind to that as well. So, um, yeah. That's, that's, I think, as much as I want to say on that. And, um, yeah. Just see if you can treat every experience with the same loving kindness because one is not more um, valuable than another. You know, even if you're going through great distress, that is also a valuable learning experience because we have to learn how to embrace and understand everything that arises and also see its impermanent nature. Okay. <laughs>
<laughs> Love is the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's spiritual growth. Hmm. M. Scott Peck, The Road Less Travel. Do I agree with this definition? <laughs> It's one definition, certainly. Um, is it a will? Willingness, perhaps? Love is the willingness to extend oneself? It's a part of loving kindness, certainly. I mean, if we're not actually willing to sacrifice ourselves at all or give for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's growth, then perhaps there's not very much meta there. But I mean, the Buddha spoke about love as so much more than that. So, as well as extending ourselves, I, I guess this to me sounds a little bit more like the will is involved, like we're purposely extending ourselves, which is fine. But I think in order for it to be sustainable and to really expand, we actually have to build it up, cultivate it. And for this, I don't know if anyone else has taught such a beautiful, direct way as the Buddha so he really has, uh, you know, methods for this. And he says it can be cultivated. Um, but certainly there's that selfless aspect to it. And there's also the wisdom aspect, which maybe this doesn't really cover. For the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's spiritual growth. So yes, I mean, that's a high kind of um, love. But we have to know really what is in our best interest and what is really in favour of our own or another spiritual growth. And I think for that, um, wisdom needs to be involved as well. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's certainly an aspect of loving kindness. Anyone else? What do other people think? Hello? So it's um, a definition from that book that I'm reading, mm -hmm. um, which I found interesting. Yeah. I guess um, when I was trying to kind of think about whether that applied to people in my life, it was mm. like, like, I think she's trying to make the point that just kind of care and affection is what we usually describe as love, but yeah. this is like a slightly more um, complex, mm. uh, like, yeah, the idea of extending yourself yeah. for someone else's well-being. Yeah. And when she says spiritual, she's talking about like body, mind, kind yeah. of soul, like yeah. religious or not religious. Right, so, right, right. Um, so I found it quite interesting. How it is. It, in that way. it is quite a nice definition because it is talking about um, the purpose being nurturing someone's spiritual growth. I mean, loving kindness is not only for one's spiritual growth. It's also for one's well-being generally. Um, it also wishes that one is healthy, one is safe, one is even materially provided for. It can be many things, but certainly the kind of love that is interested in another person's spiritual growth, if it's with wisdom, can be very, very powerful because that is, I guess, it's not what everybody wants, but it's what is really going to serve us the most, so... Yeah, there's something very good about that. And this is talking about love, so the word metta has different aspects as well. Um, but it certainly contrasts it with uh, the kind of love that is just a kind of response to people who make us feel good, right? Or uh, the clinging kind of love, yeah. I suppose the trouble with, you know, trying to extend ourselves for other people's well-being is that it presumes we know what another person's well-being is and uh, sometimes we don't. So I guess in Buddhism the point of metta is actually to overcome ill will in ourselves and if we don't have ill will, if, we, if we're actually free from uh, any kind of aversion and also clinging, then we can be pretty confident that the loving kindness is going to be uh, beneficial without even trying necessarily. Yeah. So thanks for that. I, I did actually read this recently in, a, in another book on loving kindness and I thought that was one of the better definitions. Yeah. Well, what does the Buddha say on love then? What you were saying, Buddha speaks about it in some way. 
guess what I've been describing already in um, in the talks. Um, one of the aspects of metta is a protective quality. So one of the classic definitions is even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart should we cherish all living beings. And then radiating kindness. This is literal translation of the chanting we do. Radiating kindness over the entire world. So it's very, very expansive and it goes towards people and beings that we don't even know are there. So it's a kind of, it's actually a state of meditation in its highest sense um, that becomes an abiding place. It's like a resource in our hearts that we can tap into whenever we want. And that changes eventually our actions of you know, body and speech, the way we think, and uh, the way we relate to other people in our lives in general. So it doesn't have to be very closely um, connected to a particular individual because otherwise, uh, yeah, some self-sacrifice is involved but you can't actually directly benefit everybody but you can develop loving kindness towards um, everybody when there's no hate in the heart. And the other beautiful aspect, another beautiful aspect of um, loving kindness or metta is that it's non-discriminative so it doesn't favour one over another it doesn't only go to those who are like us or those who like us <laughs> it goes to those who don't like us and who are very different from us or at least on the surface seem to be different um, so it dissolves uh, biases it dissolves um, any kind of discrimination which is really good Can we chant the Buddha's words on loving kindness in English after the Q&A sessions <laughs> to settle for the night with some extra metta? Thank you. <laughs> ah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I guess it's a matter of how much energy we all have left. At least that's my first thought. Um, yes, because my, I'm using my voice quite a lot. It's kind of a nice idea. Um, and it depends how many questions there are as well. Um, what do people think about that? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I kind of can tell. <laughs> well, that's okay. What do people think? Yeah, I feel it's a bit late too. Could we do it tomorrow, maybe? Tomorrow morning. Um. We could do it in English tomorrow morning, but I think the idea here is that um, it helps us settle for the night, so I don't know if that would really serve the purpose. Tomorrow evening? Okay. Um, there's still a Q&A session. <laughs> <laughs> maybe the person who wrote it would like to chant it. Yeah, maybe the person who wrote it would chant, I'll, I'll it, chant it in their room, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Maybe people can chant in their room, how about that? Because I feel that that will just extend the day beyond what maybe suits all of us. And I've certainly gi already given like absolute tops of my energetic capacity. So, uh, yeah. I also think because you're getting to learn the Pali, it's much more powerful in Pali. So I want to give it a bit of extra time for you to pick it up because it's something beautiful that can be with you. But... Before the end, anyway, we'll definitely chant it in English as well. Yeah. But we know we're near the end. We only just began. <laughs> I'm fond of the teaching you give when you suggest treating yourself as you would your own best friend. Hmm. Could you please say more about this practice of self-metta? Hmm. Yeah, I've thought of this before too. Like, what is a friend? And why are they a friend? How do you treat a friend? Okay, let's gather comments. <laughs> I think what you said about someone who 
and you can like confide in those mm. like you yeah when I think of my best friends they're people I can talk for absolutely hours about anything with mm. so. so a sense of trust and uh, maybe non-judgment and understanding understanding mm-hmm. yeah yeah something unconditional yeah so being and accepting them even though you totally disagree with their behaviour mm. still cherish them as a person mm. that's nice being with them and accepting their behaviours even when you disagree but you see beyond that and cherish them as a person Imagine if you could do that to yourself. Okay, we've already got a few mm-hmm. comments, so okay. <laughs> so treating yourself as you would a best friend, so treating yourself with trust. <laughs> do we trust ourselves? Or? I think that's a really powerful aspect, actually, of treating ourselves as a friend. Like not being against ourselves. How many times are we kind of at odds with ourselves and trying to push ourselves around and... You know, somebody said the other day they weren't sure if they were doing enough, I think, in the meditation, or that if they just left it, you know, would everything go wrong? Did someone say something like that? Like, can we actually trust our minds to be wise? It's an interesting one, because on my um, long retreat in Perth last year, um... I was there for six months on my own in a, in a cootie, even though the last couple of months was very busy, but still I was alone all of the day with my mind, a busy mind at this point. And uh, I remember right at the beginning sort of saying to Ajahn Brown, well, you know, how do I know kind of what to do and when and how long to sit and whether to practice more metta or breath meditation? Because six months on your own is a long time. And he said, oh, you ask your mind. You don't decide, you don't pre-decide what to do. You sit down, you contact your body, you contact your mind, and you ask it, mind? And I actually would do this. I found my own ways, but I would actually say, mind, would you like to watch the breath? And the mind sometimes just... It doesn't answer necessarily, but it just either will or it won't do it. Mm -hmm. And then if you just accept that, that's very nice. You just let the mind decide. (laughs) And that kind of trust is really beautiful because you're coming out of formulations and kind of... Sometimes we think we're we're meditating, but actually we're using our agendas to get an experience we want, right? So we think, oh, if I do this, then I'll get that. Um, But when you ask your mind what it wants, that's a sense of respect and trust. I think respect for me is a very important part of friendship. So yeah, the trusting, the confiding, the listening, understanding, but also respect. There can't really be a loving or friendly relationship with someone you don't respect. So I think learning to respect the mind and respect your body because, again, with our bodies we often look about and we think, I wish I had someone else's body. Not just visually, but physically, you know, health-wise, my body sucks. I've got all these bacteria and I can't sit as long as I wish and other people don't have them and they can eat whatever they want, you know. It really sucks having my body. And that's not very respectful of the body, you know. Because the body is always, always doing its best. And some of us may have, I don't know, congenital or genetic weaknesses or dispositions to certain illnesses. Maybe some of it is because of the places we've been. We've dragged the body to India and made it drink local water. (laughs) You know. (laughs) We've sat it on cushions for about six hours at a stretch. and (laughs) You know. We've done these things, and it's served us. It's done its best for us. But sometimes, what about asking the body what it feels like it needs right now? So that's another way of treating yourself like you would a best friend, because you wouldn't say to your friend, right, sit down there and don't get up. (laughs) (laughs) Would you? Would you? (laughs) Or drink this water. It's not been purified, but, you know. It doesn't matter. You're young. You can just take some antibiotics afterwards. (laughs) So we have to respect our body to treat it as a friend and respect our mind. No, can you do that? Even if you behave in ways that aren't always skillful? Can you see beyond that to your intention? I remember as a teenager I used to um, 
well, rebel, <laughs> like a normal teenager, really. But apparently, I was a bit intimidating to my mother. Probably she she once called me her scary teenager. So I thought, oh, okay. I thought I was just a bit um, dynamic, you know. <laughs> <laughs> But I guess I did sort of say, well, I'm doing this and that's that and you try and stop me. So I behaved like that. But <laughs> And I'm sure, you know, I wasn't too impressed with how my parents treated me all of the time either. Too controlling, not giving me enough freedom and all of that. But when I did feel down on myself, you know, and like I was being misjudged or I was maybe not happy the way they wanted me to be, then I used to remember, well... You know, I always have good intentions, and that really helped. I always, I genuinely always did have, as far as I, I know, <laughs> good intentions, maybe misguided sometimes as to what would bring me happiness, but it was a, just a, a, a kind of intention to explore. I didn't it purposely put myself in danger or any of that, but sometimes you make mistakes. So maybe, you know, just the same way that you were mentioning that we can respect a friend even if they don't always behave well. Maybe we can respect our mind as well. It's doing its best. Mm. How else do you treat yourself as your own best friend? Listening. A good friend listens, right? A good friend is there when you're happy as well as when you're sad. They still sit next to you, they hold your hand. In fact, if you're sad, they come closer with ourselves when we're sad or feeling shame or feeling depressed. We often take distance from ourselves. We don't want to be there. You know, we reject ourselves. It shouldn't be this way. Mm-hmm. But what if we actually could move in closer and hold our own hand, so to speak? Then we'd be treating ourselves like a friend. That's what a friend would do, isn't it? They'd put their arm around you. And can we put our arm around that little being inside ourselves, you know? Because it's like another little being. We've got all sorts of little beings, layers of them. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. can we put our arm around that little wounded child, you know, that didn't get the care it needed? Mm. Knowing how to respond, showing up, yeah. Showing up and staying present. Staying present. So yeah, we need a lot of tools in our kit and that's why these practices are very beautiful because the metta gives you all kinds of different ways and what I teach is not necessarily what's in the books, it's just what I practice and some creative methods that I find work for me at certain times. But uh, when we're in a retreat like this, it's highly unlikely, it might help, but it's highly unlikely that that's right what you need at this moment. So just Take these things as tools and apply them at appropriate times as needed. And you can come up with your own ideas. So metta's there, compassion is there. Uh, Certainly, you know, the general principles of infusing kindness into your awareness and also using some discursive speech are very, very helpful. Um, You know, obviously the breath, the body, whatever's happening right now that helps you to be present. And uh, and then, yeah, bringing up the idea of a best friend. Huh. I was on a retreat once. It was a self-retreat, so-called. A non-self-retreat, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> In Austria. And it was during the time between leaving Perth. No, leaving Burma. Because I got so ill. Really ill. I, nothing else would have ripped me, dragged me away from there. <laughs> Apart from that, and also that I heard Ajahn Brahm's teachings for the first time, and I knew I have to follow. I have to leave Burma to recover, but also I have to find my teacher. I have to find Ajahn Brahm. So I was in Europe, um, just wandering around as an itinerant nun with nothing, no, nothing basically, um, nowhere to go, and no monastery for support, and I uh, just had to depend on the goodwill of friends. I didn't have like a Buddhist community because I'd lived all my adult life in Asia. So I just had one or two friends here and there and one happened to be in Austria. I met her when I was doing my Indian medicine degree in London and uh, and she invited me for six weeks to stay in this beautiful house on the edge of a forest. And I remember 
practicing for six weeks and listening to Ajahn Brown's talks every day, like the deep stuff that he gives only to the monastics, which is now, by the way, available online. Mm-hmm. Deeper Dhamma podcast, but beware, you may lose your hair <laughs> <laughs> if you listen to too much. It's, it's deep, it's deep stuff, and it's it just went straight to my heart anyway. So I was practicing and feeling... It was actually straight after I'd done a lot of metta meditation and that seemed to carry me through the retreat. I was mainly practicing with Anapana. And at the end, um, in the Goenka tradition, you're used to having a metta day. And on the metta day, you speak together and you share your experience and you're kind of with spiritual friends. And I remember on my metta day, at the end of the six weeks, there wasn't anybody. And uh, I thought, oh well, never mind. I was quite at peace about it. So I went walking through the forest and then I realised... There's no one else I'd rather be with. And it was such a beautiful feeling. I realised I, I was my best friend at that time. It was so lovely. I had such a wonderful day. I'm sure I would have had a wonderful day anyway, but realising that I was with my best friend, consciously realising that, made me so happy. Yeah. So it helped me to receive my own kindness. So yeah, if you have a best friend in yourself, then those clingings and those unwholesome infatuations will slowly fade away. Maybe that's the answer to the first question about the infatuation you feel to this other person. Maybe becoming your own best friend is going to purify that a little bit. Because you're just not needy anymore. Ajahn Brahm always says he's his own best friend. and Well, he says his breath is his best friend. Then he says his nimitta is his next of kin. <laughs> and I don't know. <laughs> I mean, he's just... Whatever he has, he's, like, happy. So, <laughs> and that's beautiful because, you know, in our relationship, I, I have to admit that I'm pretty attached to having such a benevolent teacher that I can have a personal relationship with and personal guidance and support for my project and, you know, just someone to turn to for basically... At any point in my any whatever I'm going through, um, and I feel a lot of genuine loving kindness, but there's still that attachment there because I've not completed the path. But from his side, and maybe this is why I can have that trust. There is zero clinging, absolutely zero clinging, because he just doesn't need anything from anybody. You know, it, it's all coming from the dhamma that he's cultivated within himself. And that is probably why it's safe to get close to such a person, because it's so pure. You know, it teaches you also, like, it's just lovely to be able to talk about this to all of you, and I'm thinking to send him an email just to say thank you, because to be able to have such an example in my life that I could share with others and share the inspiration of that is such a blessing. It really is an amazing teaching. And bit by bit, when you're around that kind of loving kindness, it starts to get internalized. I can feel that happening. Yeah. I can feel I'm more self accepting than I was even a couple of years ago. Yeah. So, in a way, that's one uh, goal of the spiritual path, you know, to become our own best friend. And to really become our own best friend means wisdom, it means knowing what's genuinely in our own best interest and what isn't so because often we think we're following what's in our interest but normally it's because it feels good like in a hedonistic kind of way you know pleasure in the senses even if it's very refined but some things that are good for us don't necessarily feel good at the time because they might be ethically good for us some involve restraint so it might even feel like a sacrifice. But we're looking here at like creating the karma for beautiful, wholesome results to ripen in the future. So that is really what's in our best interest. Sometimes that means saying no to something you would like. Or, um, yeah, sacrificing something you want to do to do the right thing. Like, for example, when my teacher ordained, um, gave, let's say, facilitated the full ordination of women and made it possible in his tradition, his former tradition, I guess. Um, It didn't feel great, you know. He got summoned to Thailand and he got very much told off by all the Thai elders, particularly one or two. Uh, I think a Western monk who was formerly his quite close disciple. Uh, And then 
another time monk who really went too far, you know, threatening that he ought to give his monastery back to Thailand and things like this. I mean, this is ludicrous. It's an Australian charity that founded it. <laughs> and it's led by Arjun Brown. So it wasn't very nice at the time. I mean, he completely forgave everybody and I don't think he um, felt any ill will, but he did feel quite surprised because he thought these people were his friend you know but he did it because it was right and now he has the clean and happy conscience and he'll talk about that with a sense of yeah I did something good in my life you know? still he's lost a lot of his friends but he can live with himself and he has new friends <laughs> so yeah so being our own best friend means knowing what's in our own best interest genuine best interest basically avoiding unwholesome states of mind as in don't cultivate them you can't help them coming up you can learn to respond wisely but don't cultivate them don't dwell in anger don't dwell in greed don't uh, you know get carried away by the wrong people surround yourself by spiritual friends all these things are going to support you and all these things you'd want for your best friend so maybe that's another way to look at it what would you want for your best friend and see if you can give that to yourself so that ended up being quite a long answer and uh, mm -hmm. I thought we had lots of extra time, but now we don't. <laughs> but I hope some of that was useful and uh, food for thought and practice. Uh, we have three minutes. If there is anything, maybe from someone who hasn't had a question or hasn't made a comment yet, if there's anyone who would like to. Hi. Uh, yes. uh, surrounding yourself with spiritual friends. <coughs> I am in two election committees in a, the Green Party, you know, different lot and stuff. And there's so many. I mean, it, no, not all of them are spiritual friends, <laughs> to say it the least. And it, it, it gets to me a little bit. Like, it's, uh, you know, they, they power fighting stuff. Mm. You, you sort of get in behind the scene so to speak and um, it's something that I probably maybe should step back or hmm yeah I mean you said it was the Green Party I mean I'm not meant to get political but presumably you're there because there's some value aligned reason yeah. that you know you do agree with the the, yeah. the values that they hold so I don't know that you have to totally step back, but what? how would it be if you could have a contrast? You know, you could have also a community of spiritual friends, mm -hmm. if at all possible. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, maybe cultivate your practice so that it becomes more of a resource, so that you can recover from any of the kind of <laughs> difficult aspects, but then go in feeling resourced and empowered and having spiritual friends you can talk to later... And maybe that will help for some of that other stuff to just wash over you. Then you can focus on the the reasons that you're there, perhaps. Yes. Mm, that could help. Or I don't know if it's possible to be do a little bit less but still continue. Yeah. Maybe from, I don't know, maybe more online or... You said you were involved in two, so maybe... Yeah. It's too much. It's a little bit too much. That's yeah. too much. It's always this balance, isn't it, between a sense of activism in the world and then finding our own, whatever you can call it. I want to say centre, but not in the sense there's really something in there. <laughs> but just our own resource, place that we can come back to and recover and recharge. Yeah. I mean, I don't find that balance at the moment. I'm constantly, you know, giving out. <laughs> but it's a learning process. I mean, I guess the beautiful thing about monastic life is whatever you're doing, it is mainly, it is for the Dhamma. It is entirely for the Dhamma. But even there, you know, you 
have to be careful not to completely burn out your energy. So, yeah, I suppose we can always do a little bit less. I always think I can always do a little bit more, but <laughs> maybe <laughs> we have to think we can always do a little bit less and still, you know, be doing good in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Because eventually we're not going to change the world, right? It's impossible. But we can change ourselves and how we show up in the world. And that will help. That will have a big effect. All right. <laughs> so shall we just sit quietly for a moment or lie down quietly? <laughs> to end the day. Okay, and a special treat, maybe, hopefully. I'll chant a little bit of metta <coughs> to send you off into a nice sleep. <laughs> Not here, though, okay. When you get back. <laughs> Sound. Sound. Sound.